Welcome everybody. So today's session has been delivered by the LEP's very own economic ana analyst, Simon. Um, he's here today to provide some insight into the potential employment opportunities that may emerge over the coming years, uh, set the context of the unique and challenging economic conditions that we're all facing and answer any questions you might have on the labour market and what this looks like for the young people you support. So without further ado, over to you, Simon. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for the uh, the introduction. Yeah, I'm going to um, just quickly share my screen here and hope that nothing technically goes amiss. So if you can just give me a shout, Ashley, just to let me know in a sec if you can see my screen. Yeah, that all looks good. Okay. Full screen. There we go. Is that full screen now? Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Okay. So this is just um, an indication of what I'm going to talk through um, in the presentation. Um, I've sort of built in um, after each segment of the presentation, just a little pause for questions. If, if anybody wants to um, come up with anything, then as, as Ashley said, please also feel free to put some stuff in the, uh, the questions feed. I'm trying to sort of get a balance in this of um, providing some data and technical um, information, but I'm trying to at the same time keep that to a minimum. So some of this will be fairly high level. I'll occasionally sort of drop down into something um, that's a bit more data focused, but hopefully at the end of this, uh, we come away with a bit of an understanding um, of what the labour market looks like and where we think the labour market might be going. So just a quick um, recap, and I'm going to focus um, in this section on really sort of the, the impact of uh, COVID lockdowns um, and Brexit and what effect they've had really on the national economy and the local economy combined. Um, there are some distinctions, obviously, as a local economy that we've experienced, but, but broadly speaking, our experience has been in line um, with that of, of much of the, uh, the country. And um, Quite obviously, everyone will be aware that hospitality, leisure, uh, entertainment and retail were really the areas that were most severely hit um, by lockdown uh, restrictions. What we have started to pick up through the business intelligence surveys that we run and also, also through the jobs and vacancy data that we monitor is that the, the leisure and hospitality sector in particular seems to have rebounded very healthily. Um, and probably at a faster rate than we were anticipating, probably no small measure stimulated by the rate at which uh, staycationing has become uh, more, if you like, popular um, through the, the restrictions that, that we've been facing. It'll be interesting to see as restrictions are further lifted, what effect that may or may not have on the local tourism uh, and hospitality sector. Retail, on the other, other hand, I think is, is one that's had the most obvious um, scarring effect. Not to say that it's been unilateral across all forms of retail and in every location. I think there is uh, there's variation within that. I'm not going to go into too much of that detail now, but I think much of what's happened um, in the retail sector is connected um, with the idea of more online shopping, which is obviously accelerated. And also from the second point there um, that, that's in the bullet points, around this um, increased take up um, of working from home. Again, I'd like to stress, obviously the working from home bit only applicable to those people uh, that can work from home in their given occupation. It's still very difficult to, I think, really unpick quite how this is going to pan out. The, the indications are at the moment that it seems most businesses and most organizations will shift to some kind of pattern of, say, a hybrid two, three-day work, work, uh, workday split. Now, I think this is where the place-based uh, piece of this becomes quite significant. So if I think of two examples off the top of my head that I'm familiar with, Bury St Edmunds as a town centre, not massively reliant on workday, uh, you know, five days a week office footfall in order to sustain it as a retail centre compared to somewhere like Ipswich, which is far, far more reliant 
um, on that footfall. So there's two different types of behaviour within town centres there. And I think you can see um, the struggles are, are probably a bit more severe compared to, to the other. So that sort of illustrates some of the variation. I think it's going to take us time to, to understand that. I think overall, um, the sort of longevity of these effects is still very hard to, to unpick at the moment. One thing I will say in summary is that if you think about the, the self-employment and the, the furlough schemes as a mechanism to dull the edge of the impact in terms of sort of mass unemployment, which I think as all analysts were predicting at the, the beginning of lockdown, we were thinking that the unemployment rate could shoot up maybe as high as somewhere around 15%. It does seem to have mitigated um, that impact to, to quite a surprising degree. And we never really saw unemployment sustain much above, say, four, five, six percent for any length of time. And it, it's now actually come down to uh, where it was at pre pandemic levels. That said, at the same time, we are seeing claimant rates um, still at an elevated level. So, what we're starting to see is that. You've not necessarily seen people outright losing their jobs. People are sort of in some form of employment, but it might not be at the same level or paying quite the same wages. So it's it's worth just thinking about that type of data in a, in a little bit more depth as just looking at the unemployment rate in isolation is potentially a little bit misleading as to actually what's going on. Um, obviously, alongside uh, what's happened with the COVID uh, lockdown impact. We've we've left the the EU trading agreement. This has undoubtedly also had um, a very big um, impact on the way our economy behaves and the way that businesses can fundamentally trade. We did undertake quite a bit of um, research on this a couple of years ago, working with a consultancy. Um, there's details of that there. I'm, I'm happy to share details of that with anyone that wants to go into it in more depth. It is quite technical, it is quite detailed. And what you've got there is essentially an extract looking at what would happen if we had uh, a deal agreed, which is in the left-hand column, versus no deal agreed in the right-hand column. Uh, unsurprisingly, the no deal outcome uh, would have potentially been worse. And I think it's, it's fair to say we're sort of probably somewhere in the middle of those, those two things as we stand at the moment. The issue is really that the, the impacts of um, coming out of the trade agreement with the EU are almost inextricably intertwined with the impacts of the COVID lockdown, particularly around uh, that row where it talks about workforce and freedom of movement. That's been a real added complication in trying to understand what's fundamentally going on in terms of labour and talent shortages in the economy. Um, I think without COVID, it would have been far clearer to understand what the impact of coming out of the trade agreement and that the freedom of movement of people agreement had actually been. So, for example, one of the things I haven't put in the presentation, again, because it's, it's a bit technical, is a, a data feed that tracks the volume of people that are from overseas and register for national insurance. Now, if you look at the impact on that graph for what happens as a result of Brexit, there was a drop. We did lose people, but it semi recovered and wasn't far off where it was um, prior to being in the EU. And then you see the impact of the COVID lockdowns, where that volume of people absolutely falls off the edge of a cliff and has stayed very, very low. The data feed hasn't quite updated yet to see if it's starting to recover. But that's just an indication of where these two things combined really have had an impact. And it's very hard to discern actually what's caused what particular outcome at the moment. We're still in the process of trying to, to figure that out. And of course, how quickly those things may or may not recover. I'll just pause there quickly just to see if anybody's got initial questions about that sort of very quick kind of macro look back at, at what we've been been dealing with before I move on to the next segment. Are we all clear, Ashley? Yeah, nothing else. Uh, if anyone wants to come off mute and ask a question, please do. If not, there's nothing in the chat, Simon. Okay, cool. Right, so this is going to be a sort of quick um, 
overview of the, the Norfolk and Suffolk economy, just to give you some idea of, uh, broadly speaking, um, where the, the Norfolk and Suffolk economy has come from over the last five years and where we may think it may be going in the next five years. Uh, we have just uh, produced an economic strategy, um, which again is a very detailed document. Again, that's available um, on our website if you want to understand some of the things around this in more detail. But broadly speaking, we've seen growth across major metrics, including population, including jobs, um, and including wages. So one level, all of that looks relatively healthy. Um, obviously, there will be a blip in, in some of these things uh, around the impact of, of what we've, we've just talked about to do with trade agreement and, um, and, and COVID lockdowns. But overall, there is still an incremental upward trend in most of the major um, metrics. But what we are seeing is that the growth rate isn't quite as fast as the rest of the country, if the rest of the country is understood as an average. And I think this applies really um, pretty much across the board. So if you look at business growth, if you look at GVA, which is a measure of productivity, if you look at average wages, if you look at attainment rates, we're still somewhat lagging behind in terms of the Norfolk and Suffolk economy behind the national average. Now, obviously, within that, there are pockets of clusters of businesses or individual businesses that are really soaring and are really doing well. So it's not to say that sort of every sector and every business is below the average. It, it's very much looking at what the economy is doing as a whole. So we're still creating jobs. Um, at quite a healthy rate. We do have a very healthy employment rate compared to the rest of the country. Where we do still seem to have a bit of a deficit is in jobs that would be deemed or, or labelled as perhaps slightly higher value. Uh, and typically that would be defined by being slightly higher paid. So we've got good levels of employment, but the employment that we have isn't necessarily, in a lot of instances, tend to be quite as well paid as other parts of the country. This then probably has the effect that in certain industries in particular, we are uh, sort of losing talent, um, particularly I think from the data that we've looked at um, from the point at which people say leave school or leave university up until the point when they perhaps start to think about settling down and having a family. And then we actually see more of a positive influx of people back in. So it's not a completely sort of dire picture, i.e. that all of these people just leave the area and never ever come back. Um, but obviously of those people that do leave, you are uh, not retaining everybody. So we've got a bit of a, a challenge there, I think, about a how we try to retain maybe a few more of our talented people, um, and also perhaps how we more effectively communicate how good it is um, to actually live in this area the people who aren't familiar with it. So we attract some sort of fresh talent in because whilst I've, I've sort of rattled on there a little bit to say that our economy perhaps isn't as, um, as highly geared as other parts of the country, actually when you look at some metrics around things like well-being, um, life satisfaction, quality of life, actually this region scores very, very well um, in comparison to the rest of the country. Indeed, several of our locations regularly rank in the top 10, top five of sort of best places to, to live and, and raise a, a, a family in the UK. So we've certainly got some potential to, to address some of this. OK, so to sort of drilling down a little bit more now into the, the data segment of the presentation, this is a term location quotient, which is a bit of technical jargon. Um, I'm going to try and keep it simple. What this chart is showing is what the concentration of jobs in certain sectors or disciplines is versus the national average. So unsurprisingly, given the character of where we are, agricultural, forestry and fishing scores very highly, i.e. we've got a large concentration in relation to the rest of the country. This isn't talking about volume of jobs, though. That will be in the, the next slide. This is simply talking about concentration of things. But down the middle, you may just be able to make out there's a sort of a faint line, which is the national average. So anything where the bar chart is to the right of that line shows that we have a, a higher rate than the national average. So from this chart, we can see that agricultural fishing, arts and entertainment, 
infrastructure management from accommodation and food services higher concentrations of employment in our economy as a whole most of the other ones are at or around the national average um probably the two at the bottom are worth just noting the professional scientific and technical services a little bit less for concentration and uh, information and, and communication which is a, a kind of fit for it but um i'll come on to explain that in a little bit more detail as well it's not a terribly good capture of the detail actually around the itc sector and actually i think the rate of demand and the rate of employment in the it um, sector is actually higher in this region than perhaps this particular graph is showing. so this is actually looking at volumes of jobs available um, currently in the, the economy and again similar to the previous one the little lines um, that are sort of the gray dashes that shows you the national average and then that shows you what where Norfolk and Suffolk is in terms of the blue lines in relation to that. So the ones where we clearly employ quite a few people, again, manufacturing, uh, human health and social work activities, wholesale and retail, um, and construction and accommodation and food services. So those tend to be the ones where we've got the most um, sort of job opportunities, perhaps in comparison um, to the rest of the uh, the country in terms of volume of jobs. And you can see there that the two the two clear top ones in terms of overall volume is that wholesale uh, and, and retail trade and human health and social work. I think it's worth noting that in some ways that wholesale and retail trade kind of captures part of what we think of perhaps traditionally as uh, logistics, but also so does the category about midway down that says transport and storage. So we can see that actually as a whole, that is quite an important sector um, for this part of the world. Now, that sort of the previous slide is telling us where we're at at the moment. This one perhaps starts to give us a bit of a hint as to where the current rate of job growth is, uh, because obviously for the purpose of this presentation, we're not just interested in what's going on right now, but we're also perhaps trying to keep an eye on what the jobs market might look like in say five, 10 years time. This actually gives us a slightly different indication where professional scientific and technical services ranked quite the, the or near the bottom on some of those previous slides, we can see from here that actually it has the fastest growth rate um, over the last five years. And you know we don't have anything at the moment to indicate that growth rate is necessarily going to particularly change. So that could be an area to very much um, keep a focus on. We still see things like arts, entertainment, recreation. And food and accommodation services being areas where there will be job opportunities. However, I would say in particular those two sectors worth bearing in mind, a lot of the employment in those two particular sectors tends to be part time, stroke casual and isn't particularly highly paid. So it's also worth looking at, at charts like this and thinking about the types of jobs that might offer more full time, more permanent and potentially uh, higher wage opportunities and perhaps better progression opportunities and that's where sectors perhaps like professional scientific and technical financial insurance and construction might be worth thinking about one thing um i think i do have to sort of throw in as a bit of a caveat here on some of the data i've just run through with you there is that that data is based on looking at the economy broken down by quite rigid sectors. That doesn't always necessarily tell you very much about the skills that are required within the economy. And I think those two things are distinct. And I think it's becoming increasingly hard and in some ways misleading just to look at labour market information purely on a sector breakdown. So to give you an example, skills around things like ICT, software development, software programming, they're increasingly in demand across all sectors. But often when they're counted, they're counted as being in another sector. So for example, if you're employed by an insurance company, but actually you're working as a programmer, very often that job will be counted as being in the financial sector rather than the job that you're actually doing, which is IT based. So this is an example of where scanning all of the, the posted job adverts um, that are in sort of the mainstream um, job advertising sites, 
we can see what the, the demand is um, for different jobs across the piece. Here we can see that skills such as auditing, nursing, personal care, finance, warehousing, uh, and skills related to, related to mental health are in pretty high demand um, in relation to this part of, of the UK. But again, we can also see um, from the little dashes there what it's like in relation to the, the national scale of demand. Because I'm conscious, obviously, that everyone that you'll be working with won't necessarily just be looking for a job um, in the, the local economy. They'll be looking for what employment opportunities are, perhaps more, more broadly um, and in the round. I think it's worth noting, particularly on this slide, that one of the things that is a characteristic of our uh, our local economy and our local demographic is we do have a much higher proportion of over 65s than the national average. And I think this goes some way to explain why things like personal care, nursing and mental health tend to rank as being in very high demand in our part of the world. And I think if you look at some of the demographic projections, it's likely that if anything, that trend will accelerate um, through the next decade, i.e. we're going to have an even higher proportion um, of older people in this part of the world. Again, it's just one of those, those quirks of, of how things work out. We're a very nice area to live. We're very safe. We're relatively affordable. So we do get quite a large influx of people from elsewhere in the UK that see this area, understandably, as a nice and affordable place to actually um, retire. So that's just worth bearing in mind. So any questions just on any of that as I've, I've run through because I'm aware I've thrown quite a bit at you there. Um, someone's just uh, on the previous slide the auditing section is that as in financial auditing and accounting? Predominantly yes so this is sort of a search it is effectively based on a word search so it's, it's kind of looking at how frequently is that particular word posted in all of the job adverts that we see um, and, and as, as a skill that's, that's required. So I would imagine that, yes, in this instance, auditing is largely reflected of something that's either uh, numerical or financial based. Yes. Thank you. Any more at all? There aren't any more chat. Has anyone got any that they want to ask directly? So we're going to move on now to to look at um, what the, the sort of future projections for job opportunities might be. I will caveat this massively um, by saying that making specific uh, predictions or projections about exactly how many jobs are going to be available in which sectors or in which locations is obviously incredibly, um, incredibly difficult uh, because there's so many uh, factors that are ultimately um, sort of unpredictable and outside of our direct control as the recent experience of, as lockdowns have, have sort of um, illustrated. However, at the same time, I think there are some major trends um, sort of underway in the economy, some of which I think will, will advance, um, they might advance at different rates, but I think are, are almost inexorable that they will, they will come about at, at some point. Uh, and the three the three areas that through repeated analysis we've um, sort of identified as potentially quite distinct and um, high value opportunities in, in this part of the UK are around clean energy, um, around agri-food. I should just stress that agri-food isn't just about growing food, it's about also um, all of the logistics that surround um, food and it's also very much around the uh, research and development around how to grow food uh, in a cleaner, more greener way, how to uh, improve soil usage and how to grow through food more efficiently, different um, environmental conditions, things like that. So that's quite a broad, broad base. And ICT digital. I think that that's the thing that's probably the main focus um, throughout this presentation is kind of repeatedly underlining how it's not just about thinking of, of ICT digital as a standalone sector. So if anyone's familiar with, say, um, what BT do out of the Astral Park, you know, that's a big ICT installation there. 
but actually what they're doing um, there is, is a lot of work that drives ICT and digital across the piece and, and really this is something that's applicable to, to all sectors and there is increasing demand for people with those skills in almost every facet of, of employment that you can think of. So just a quick sort of summation of that um, here. One of the things I think I wanted to stress is that we, we're sort of trying to look here at two types of data, one being quantitative, and that was the stuff that I was showing earlier in the bar chart. These are things that we can enumerate very easily in one way or another. But I think combined with this, particularly when we're trying to look at what might happen in the future, as I said before, some of those models are quite challenging, difficult, and sometimes unreliable in actually figuring out what, what needs to happen. I think it's important that we, as we are now, increasingly blending that with more qualitative data and input. And this is where we engage in uh, surveys and conversations with businesses and with employers to really try and get into more of the detail of actually what it is they feel they need, what they're likely to need in the future, what they're struggling with um, at the moment. So that's where you start to see employers coming through and saying, yes, on the one hand, we absolutely need uh, people coming through with better STEM related skills, i.e. We, we need that as a basis, people that are, are competent in, in science, technical engineering and mathematics disciplines. And to be honest, that's at all levels. That's not just at, it's not just at the high end. That's at all levels, you know, sort of two, three, four, five. But also the need for people to come through with what we might think of typically as more softer skills. So things around team working, communication, the ability to, as I'm doing now, to present. These are also skills that are fundamental um, to filling, I think, the needs of, of employers as, as they uh, enter into the workplace now. So there's a, a sort of range also, I think, um, underlying this of major projects um, that are in the pipeline in this part of the world. Some of these are really exciting. They're on a scale that probably hasn't been seen for a few generations um, in terms of the scale of employment um, that they could potentially offer. So I think it's worth um, just dwelling on those. I'll come to those in a moment. So quickly, I'll talk through just here. This is a, a slide about the clean energy market opportunity. Give you some idea there about the number of businesses, the number of jobs, and also some of the, the really big brands um, that we actually have located um, in this part of the world. And I think sometimes we're not aware quite enough of actually what's in our, um, in our backyard. I think the team that, that actually works in the ANT are doing a cracking job, I think, of trying to get these companies um, integrated with schools in a, in a far more effective way so that young people do understand actually who's out there on their doorstep as a potential um, employer. Uh, this is the one for agri-food and again you'll see there from um, some of the brands that are listed just the diversity um, and the scale of opportunity that's available in this part of the world. Um, we really are sort of at the cutting edge um, of a lot of the, the stuff that's going in, particularly around uh, efficiency in crop growing, um, as I said before, sort of around effective use of soils, uh, innovations around vertical farming. We really are right at the, the cutting edge of that. Not only do we have the research um, facilities here, but we can actually deploy it in the actual food growing uh, production activities. And then finally, just there, just to sum up around the um, the ICT digital um, opportunity, sort of listed there are some of the, the the companies that we've got. And again, I think some of the things we wouldn't necessarily initially think of listed there is something like Norwich University of the Arts, um, actually has one of the the most highly rated um, courses in the country um, um, around software development and, and visualization in the digital sense. So there are some some really good opportunities for anybody that does have talent in here to, to really sort of get exposed to top flight um, teaching and um, really good opportunities um, that will be coming through the pipeline. So this is what I was talking just earlier there around major projects um, that are either very much underway or will be very soon um, be expanding in Norfolk and stuff. The first one there is, is Sizewell C. 
um, quite apart from when the, the site is actually um, built and uh, in operation, the direct employment um, opportunities that will be available there. It is, of course, an enormous construction project that actually gets it to that phase. And a lot of the, the skills and the talent that will be developed through that are then equally deployable in a range of these other um, projects and, and opportunities that are listed here, such as free ports, such as renewables, such as clean growth, all of those skilled trades disciplines that will be needed, logistic skills, the construction skills, they have a transference actually beyond the life um, of size well C. So I think that's really something we're carefully thinking about for people as they're looking at potential um, career opportunities. Free ports, um, just in case anyone's unfamiliar with those, so um, in and around Felixstowe and just up the road on the A14 uh, near Stowe Market, there's two sites that were in the process of um, securing that will offer massive incentives um, to businesses to locate there um, through, through various mechanisms. Fundamentally, it means we can drive up uh, inward investment, we can drive up trade, and we can introduce um, perhaps some really exciting businesses that we've not previously had the opportunity to introduce there. And again, that will offer, uh, I think, a greater diversity of employment opportunity in the local economy than we've We've seen before. Renewables mainly centred around um, offshore wind. I'm sure, probably everybody on this call is aware that uh, there's, a, there's a massive opportunity off of our coast, and that will be um, a sort of ongoing project for at least two, three, four decades. There will be operations and maintenance, there will be upgrades, there will be infrastructure projects all connected with that, that again will generate quite a high volume of. Uh, very well paid and, and, and stable employment opportunities. I mentioned before about the, the clean growth um, aspect. That really is kind of the, the golden thread that runs through the overall economic strategy for, for Norfolk and Suffolk over the next um, couple of decades. When you start looking at the um, scale of investment and upgrade and retrofit, that will be necessary in order to meet our zero carbon commitments. This is in terms of uh, retrofitting um, heating uh, systems in homes, insulating them better, similar things in business premises all around uh, the installation of heat pumps, the establishment of hydrogen networks or uh, hydrogen mixed networks as a, as a means of heating homes. On top of that, the uh, electric uh, vehicle capacity that will need to be um, installed again, both in private homes and in just general usage. There is masses of, uh, of employment opportunities that will be coming through the, the line. Um, again, much of this, I think, is likely to be around some kind of STEM based qualification because a lot of this is about um, having qualifications in, uh, for example, um, electrical engineering or electrical installation. Um, which require at least some level of competence in that area. I've mentioned before about the, the ageing population challenge um, that we face. Whilst there may be a degree to which um, some of the labour requirement for that may be offset through technology, innovation and automation, there is clearly going to be uh, a need for uh, an ongoing labour supply effectively just to help look after um, our ageing population. And finally, there just a note around um, automation. So this is a term that's sort of regularly used to uh, allude to effectively certain jobs or tasks being able to be in the future performed either entirely by technology or some form of robot or cobot, which then removes the need um, for a human to actually um, perform that task. I think it's safe to say that sort of accurate and reliable models for exactly what jobs um, are going to be impacted by that are still not wholly something we can absolutely rely on. But I think it's a fair bet from a lot of the data that I've seen um, and the reports that have been produced so far that those jobs that are obviously more labour intensive uh, in general, have more of a hazardous contingent to them, are probably more likely 
to face a, a threat, if you like, from uh, automating something that's sort of manually intensive and is repetitive, and as I say, has some sort of hazardous element to it. Those tend to be the types of job disciplines where um, various industries are moving the most quickly to install some form of, of automation. I'm just going to pause quickly there in case anybody's got any questions before us go on to the last piece. Nothing really. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's just really wanting to um, sort of flag up really sort of the opportunities around around digital skills, and I think really in this slide the thing that I wanted to really sort of flag up is that the one that the demand for these skills really is very high at the moment. What we are tracking. Um, at the minute is that one of the unforeseen consequences um, of the, 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 the higher frequency of working from home is that actually it's become much more competitive now for, for talent. So we're seeing companies, certainly from London or even further afield, who are able to offer people with, with good digital skills much, much higher weights of remuneration and wages than they would necessarily be able to secure working for a company in Norfolk and Suffolk. So we are experiencing that. Obviously, what that's creating is more opportunity in the local economy. We're seeing more and more companies that are really desperate to try and recruit people who uh, have either an aptitude or a real interest um, around this. I mean, even anecdotally, uh, we've seen companies that have sort of found a young person, literally been saying to them, great, can you come along to this session? Oh, and by the way, if you happen to have a friend is interested in this, can you bring them as long as well? Because they're just really desperate to try and secure people. And I think in in certainly in the, the the sort of near to medium term, these are jobs that offer quite a lot of diversity in terms of the fields and sectors that you can you can end up working in. And they generally tend to lead to career paths that are quite well paid. Um, so at the moment it's it's looking like quite an attractive area. Um, for people to to become involved with, and it's it's very diverse in terms of it's not just about programming, it's not um, just about necessarily uh, doing something to do with networks. There is a very wide range of of roles and jobs that are involved in that. Some that cover more of the kind of business development and the sales side of things, so slightly less technical, but more um, sort of people focused. So. There is quite a wealth of quite in-depth information um, that's broken down um, on a sectoral basis that's available again um, from our website. And recently we've also updated the overarching local skills report. So this looks at the, uh, if you like, the skills need in the economy as a whole at the moment. And again, also builds in some projections uh, from the future. Both of these things are available um, from our, our website. And of course, if anybody um, just wants a bit of guidance in terms of navigating those documents to understand sort of the best one to look at for a particular area that you may be interested in, by all means, um, get in touch and we can we can help figure that out because there really is quite a lot to, to wade through there. But but it does it's good that it covers um, that amount of, of ground. Any questions just before we move on to the last slide. OK. So yeah, just three, I think three sort of key takeaways. Um, it's really just sort of to flag up just the the breadth and diversity of opportunity that is available um, out there in the local economy. I think it probably is broader than Perhaps a lot of young people initially appreciate. Um, also to think about some of the sort of core underlying skills. So rather thinking about going into a specific industry, what are the underlying skills that may be actually cutting across industry in order to give that opportunity of more sustained employment? And I think on a sort of more positive um, note, whilst yes, um, a lot of the data and research has indicated that young people have been have been badly affected by um, COVID lockdowns. 
this is something that, that's not unique actually to, to young people when we've looked at the data for people over 50. Um, they've equally um, been, been badly affected in terms of employment opportunities um, and training opportunities. I think the, the, the good thing for young people is the scale of support and help and funding is really there in place to help them albeit sometimes it, it can sometimes be a bit challenging navigating the plethora of stuff that's out there, but there is quite a lot out there um, for them to, to access. And then really just to sort of end by saying that, that clean growth um, opportunity and maybe really thinking about jobs, skills and development that relates to that. And hopefully that's something I think that does chime with a lot of young people and hopefully you engage their, their interest and attention is really worth um, focusing on. I think particularly around say something like I've, I've referred to a couple of times this presentation around STEM, that does sometimes sound quite dry and perhaps a bit boring, you know, science, technical engineering, maths. but actually if you're intent on doing something that's in that clean growth field and if you're, you're really interested in um, helping, if you like, drive towards that net zero carbon goal, actually having those skills is, is like to be quite fundamental with you um, sort of achieving that that aim and that's about it from me. So I mean there was one chat in, uh, question in the chat sorry around um, the digital and IT professions I think they're asking so are more people tending to stay in the region and working from home rather than moving to the big cities? Yeah so what we've seen is that it's not necessarily about people physically relocating. So I think that what we, we tended to see is a slightly offhand example. Let's just say you had a, an IT firm in Old Street in, in London, sort of right at the heart there, where they were saying to people, well, you expect to come into the office four or five days a week. That may have put some people off. What they're now actually saying is, well, I'll tell you what, come in once a month and we'll more or less double your wages. You know, that, that's an incredibly compelling offer for somebody where they pretty much do have the best of both worlds. They can get the London wages and actually don't have to give up um, living somewhere pleasant in the country and they don't have to do the, the commute. So that that is likely to be, I think, certainly over the next few months, maybe even the next few years, quite a serious challenge for, for the sector in this part of the world to, to deal with. Thank you. Has anybody else got any further questions? If you more than welcome to come off mute and ask Simon or pop them in the chat. I will follow in this, send round um, any links and um, papers that Simon's mentioned throughout. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously if there's anything that occurs to somebody after the call, by all means, um, just drop me, a, drop me a line, we can get back to you, that's fine. Okay. Well, if no one's got anything else, then thank you very much. Um, I will stop recording and oh, some people are just